Thursday, October 10th at 6 p.m. Um, I would ask that um, Brandy or Rachel note roll call, and I would ask Keith to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, the new edition. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I caught Keith off guard. That's not common no, that's, or yeah. easy. <laughs> All right, um, no immediate announcements. Um, I would ask for a motion to approve the minutes from September 12th. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Any edits, corrections, or comments? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Um, no additional appearances and, but so we'll move to new business. And our first item is update by Prudential Investments. And if just for tickles and grins, if you could give us your name and address, that would be good for the record. Sure. Uh, Josh Satzer again, Prudential Advisors right over in Token Creek, downtown Token Creek on Highway 19. So uh, myself and uh, Adam Klimas, who's over at our Wauwatosa office or Sussex office, I guess is, you know, I've been handling the account now uh, for a few years. So um, I've been in the business 25 years. I've seen election years, market cycles, everything from this, you know, start of my career back in 1999, the tech run up and then the, you know, dot com meltdown there. So, um, <clears throat> but I think Alex has got the, the most recent statement up there. So thanks for putting that up there, Alex. So you'll see uh, for the year 2024, we've had sound investment results increase of over 100,000 in value from where it was at as of January 1st. So in a, you know, moderately conservative portfolio, it's been uh, solid, um, solid year so far. Obviously, the uh, stock market run up has helped that, and good diversification. Um, you know, just so just kind of fill you in on our thoughts brief, briefly. Uh, you know, there, there's typically a lot of volatility in an election year leading up to an election. Um, historically, typically positive years. Uh, there's no correlation a year after election as to you know, up market or down market, people like to think, well, if so-and-so is, is elected, it's going to go down if, you know, so a lot of that is, you know, is fallacy or, or uh, in, in, incorrect thinking based upon history. If you look one year out from. So once and just like, oh, okay. got it. I'm used to my Friday night, Mike, I do the uh, public address announcing for some Prairie West football and I'm used to my Mike having to hold it down and <laughs> continue. I usually continue it or, uh, but anyways, so historically one year after an election, there's no correlation to up or down markets over time. Um, so there could be some immediate downturns. We could see some value lost on a monthly or three month basis, but it's nothing to be concerned about typically based upon what, what we'll we would look at if we were looking at things in November first of twenty twenty five. Um so you know the the things that we're seeing uh you know there's more tension. The Fed will probably continue to cut interest rates uh you know back from their increases that they had previously. Uh, they don't want to overcorrect and it seems like inflation is is somewhat in order according to some of the recent numbers. So um and uh you know, there's always heightened global tensions and based upon situations. So, you know, there will be some volatility like I talked about. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to be keeping accounts somewhat more defensive as a result of that volatility, but but nowhere out of line with, a, you know, the investment strategy that we have in, in line, you know, being moderately conservative and as an organization such as yours should be. So, um, 
heavy focus, you know, a heavy focus on a portfolio like that is more on dividend yields because they're consistent, uh, they're consistent and 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 safe. So, um, you know, bottom line is always safety with uh, you know with some with some upside. One of the things that's going to occur later this year, and it's more just an, an Alex probably uh, situation, is Prudential Advisors is is uh, our broker dealer Pruco Securities is merging with LPL. And LPL is the largest uh, broker dealer of independent advisors out there, and that's going to be happening in late November. Um, there won't be any change to holdings, nor Adam or I. It's just going to be a matter of what your statements will look like, and we're not sure on the repapering of anything or signatures. We might need a couple signatures to adopt the uh, LPL as a broker dealer, but we'll know more about that uh, after November 18th when that's going to happen. But again, it's a positive in our eyes from that standpoint, um, having a cutting edge platform to be able to do what we do for people. So, so any other thoughts, questions, or uh, maybe Alex, you, uh, I can't quite see the number, the number there, but uh, I'm going to maybe share that with the group. I see the the number. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Too small. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, well, oh, one point one six. Uh, yeah. I'm totally lost here. He just can't. He just can't see it. Yeah, the, 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 the 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 figure of the current value is just under one point one six million, as far as the yeah, as far one, as yeah, one point one five is what you're saying. Somebody. Oh, there you go. Got it. Somebody figured it out. Thank you. All right. Right. So what you're seeing on that statement in the upper left-hand corner too, that that won't say Pruco Securities after after November. That'll say LPL Advisors. And you and Adam are still going to be with us? Oh, for sure. All right. For sure. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things. Prudential Advisors isn't going anywhere. They wanted to do what's best for all of us to make sure we're on the cutting edge of platforms for people for the next 20 years. So, uh, so we all think it's a good thing. I mean, obviously anytime there's a change, it's, it leads to, you know, some, you go backwards a little bit to go forward, but um, from the standpoint of being able to, you know, be on the cutting edge with everything going forward, it's, it's best in both, both potential advisors and LPL put a lot of money into the, the merger of the, uh, the broker dealer. So that's always a good thing versus somebody being bought out, uh, you know, from, from one that, that I never liked that. I hear in that, oh, you were bought out, but so. Questions. One of the questions that, that I have is after we made a number of changes and kind of how we were approaching our investments and do you still feel like those were good changes and we're doing well with it? Yeah, I think the biggest thing was that allowed for more diversification um, and allowed for kind of open architecture before we were limited within one fund, fund family. So not to say that would have been bad and it was fine over time, but it just gives more flexibility for changes like that Adam talked about previously that he can make uh, in there. Plus, you know, opens it up to basically any, anywhere we need to go to keep, keep the diversification solid. So, and again, with the type of account, we're never going to be, you know, in an aggressive, an aggressive model with anything. Um, and, you know, the importance of having some of the best dividend paying ETFs or, you know, funds or, or stocks is now available with, with how we're set up. So it was important to be in that for the long haul. Uh, so, and, and again, short term, haven't weighed anything what would have been before now, but it's definitely better especially from the diversification standpoint. So it sounds like after the elections, it's just time for us just kind of to block, close our eyes and let you do the looking. Well, I, I think it's always good to, to keep less micromanagement of investment portfolios versus more. I think, you know, anybody who's had an advisor for a lot of years will tell you, you know, during those downturns, just don't look right. <laughs> and, and then I'll tell you when you can start looking again <laughs> uh, and trust the, trust the process and trust the markets over time. So it could be one of those periods, but again, uh, history tells us we don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and if we look November 1st of next year, based upon history, more times than not, that value will be higher than it is today. Um, so, and, and that's, that's what we're, we would think would happen, but you know, one never knows for sure, but expect volatility, expect, you know, 
bigger days up and down both directions shortly before uh, beginning of November, probably shortly after. So okay. I, I do have some of my newsletters here too. Um, I'll pass them around if anybody wants to take one. Uh, again, it's just educational things and, and things that might uh, help you become more knowledgeable reading material and, and uh, a little bit more info. So I'll pass a few of these around business cards in there. If anybody ever needed any personal advice, we're certainly open to that and, and happy to help. Great. Thank you. Out of curiosity is that you mentioned you kept you use the phrase cutting edge with the LPL switch. Is, is that uh, a euphemism for like AI type stuff? Oh, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. Uh, okay just from the standpoint that LPL has over a hundred thousand advisors on their platform, Ruco securities had two, 2000 plus. So from the standpoint of economies of scale, what they can offer to their clients over time and how they can adjust as things change. And, and, uh, you know, we need new, new options. That's the biggest thing I think, right. With everything nowadays, it seems like the economies of scale are important. And, and, you know, if, if AI becomes, you know, uh, a lot of investing is the psychological piece and the uh, analytical, the analytical piece coming into play uh, and keeping the keeping the uh, the human emotion out of out of it. So I think you know more of that's probably being used by the money managers to to make sure, but that won't necessarily impact the broker dealer change. It's just, it's just the uh, offering and cutting edge technology as well as ability to change quicker. Good. Other questions? This is good though, to see a good balance and to see progress. So Carol's smiling. So that's, a, that's good. That's our cue that everything's okay. Yeah, right. And the biggest thing too, on, on in your other assets, again, fixed rates are still much better than they were uh, two years ago, three years ago. So just, I would just encourage to continue to uh, lock in CD rates as, as you're able to with monies um, for periods of time, because if we do have a decreasing interest rate environment, you'll be happy having locked you know some of those. And I know uh, when we had some of the run up at the end of last year with the best fixed interest rates I've seen in 25 years in the business, I tried to lock people in on certain assets on the fixed portfolios for as long as I could, seven, 10 years, five years, uh, because we hadn't seen rates like that in, in 25 plus years. So. Um, so I, I would, even if it's not as good a return, a lot of times on a CD, I would lean towards longer terms versus shorter terms in a potentially decreasing interest rate environment. So good, good, good thoughts. All right. No other questions. You can't even yell touchdown. So. <laughs> touchdown Norskis, Norskis <laughs> girls golf for the win. Well, and the soccer guys just soccer. Okay. did Oregon, and my grandson lives in Oregon. And he wasn't happy. So, yeah, my daughter's my daughter's a golfer, and she grew up playing with a lot of the uh, Norsky girls golfers uh, at Lake Windsor. So it's kind of near and dear to our hearts. We're cheering hard for them uh, next week. So good. We'll we'll root for them. Okay, Rachel. I am just having a little technical difficulty with Renee. Renee, are you able to unmute now? Okay. No, you are not. Thank you for coming. Okay. Can she maybe use the chat feature if she needs to ask a question? May need may need to shut Zoom down and do it, but I need to go edit Zoom. The highest. The other thing is you could call in with your phone. And I think the phone call is Sheila. She said she was going to try to call in, but I can't confirm that because I can't unmute her. So I don't, it's the same settings that it always is. So I apologize. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, guys, we may have to reboot this, but we'll keep going with the meeting until we figure it out. How All are right. you communicating by interpretive dance? Well, I'd like to see that, Alex. <laughs> Her thumbs or her yeah, but what does Sheila do? Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we need to fix this. Um, Can you guys hear me? 
Yeah. 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 We can't. Can you hear Great. us, it, well, This is Sheila, and I can actually hear you just fine. And whatever Rachel just did worked because I got a message that I could unmute now. Okay, Renee, did you? No. But at least we can see Renee's face. So, oh, you almost were unmuted. I saw it flash. She's working on it. Okay, we can keep going. All right, well, we're going to keep going. Um, the one thing I didn't announce um, earlier in the meeting is um, our lawyer decided that we were doing our agenda wrong, even though he doesn't agree with Al. Um, and so the notice for closed session is under item 11. So we'll read it when we get down there. Um, so, but we do have uh, a closed session tonight. All right, item 7.2, discussion regarding a proposed grant application to the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. Alex, you wanna run us through that? Absolutely. So I did include a draft of the program in your packets for review. Um, I have been working in the online portal to submit the application today a little bit. And um, so the application itself is different than the program, but. I uh, wanted to get the program to you all just to see what this might look like. So at the last meeting, we discussed the possibility of doing a joint program with the Village of Windsor CDA. Um, we've had a number of different discussions with uh, both the village president, uh, Jane, and um, their community development director as well, who is also the director for their CDA. And it seems like there's pretty strong buy-in. They Their CDA met Tuesday of this week, and they passed a resolution of support for this program. So um, I haven't actually had any communications with their board, uh, just um, just Jamie, the director, and then uh, Bob, the resident over there. So um, the structure is very similar to our revolving loan program. It does look like Renee's unmuted now, so that's good. Um, <clears throat> just to go over some of the high level details, so this would would be overseen by a seven person review committee. And that would be a subcommittee of us, of the CDA. And um, our legal reps felt that we had the leeway to basically include whoever we wanted on that subcommittee, resident or not of DeForest. So that was good. So the structure would be a representative from each CDA, a representative from our participating banks, similar to how we do the loan review committee for the revolving loan program. Uh, we thought it'd be good to include the executive board president from the Chamber of Commerce, again, representing uh, the business um, aspect of their activities. One representative from the area business community it could be from either municipality. So this could be, think like, uh, you know, Evco CEO or somebody from a, a, one of our larger businesses to provide a little bit more insight an experience from the business perspective, and then um, both of the village presidents. Uh, so that would be Bob and Jane this year. And then if that ever changed, it would be however that would look. Um, so the chair of the committee would rotate annually. And so that would be chaired by uh, one of the village presidents in each year. So that would alternate. So one year it'd be DeForest village president, one year it'd be Windsor. Um, which is what we do with the fire board and it works Correct. very yep. nicely. Yeah, we tried to model this a little bit off of the, the fire board structure because that's probably the closest example of sort of an intergovernmental type of partnership. Um, that That is a very different thing because they actually have an intergovernmental agreement that needed to be in place to make that happen. We're kind of skirting around that by doing this with two CDAs, which is part of the intention here. Um, Couple other big points. There's description of how the officers are appointed and nominated, um, the review process. So there'd be quarterly reviews. So four times a year, the review committee would um, look at applications that have been collected over that three month period. Um, let's see. Eligibility is pretty broad. Uh, the WEDC grant program stipulates that 
100% of funds have to be passed through to small businesses defined as businesses with 25 or fewer full-time employees. And it's essentially open to any small business, for-profit small business within certain boundaries. So similar to how the redevelopment loan program that we have is tied to our redevelopment areas for the most part in downtown, this would be similarly structured. So it would, it would be sort of along a uh, CV, along Lake Road there, which would be considered kind of downtown as well as in here, the same boundaries that our, our loan program includes. And then going into Windsor, it would continue down Lake Road uh, towards 19 and then on, I think it's on Windsor Road where their uh, new municipal building is going is their re quote unquote redevelopment area or a future redevelopment area. Um, so, and for Windsor, it would also include their enterprise ag area. And the thought there was, this is a request from their side. Um, they wanted to, one of their priorities as a community is to support uh, local agriculture based businesses, farms, those types of things. And they have a specific area that's designated as an ag enterprise area. So this would support those businesses for the various capital needs that they have. It also is a, from a scoring perspective for applying for the WDC grant, it's a feather in our cap because they do prioritize assisting rural. So that would be a, a big, big piece for us for scoring. The eligible use of funds is very similar to the revolving loan program. Um, permanent stuff that's permanent in nature, even equipment and machinery would be permanent in nature. Obviously this is geared towards improving property values too. So it, it's supporting small businesses and their capital needs, but ultimately if those small businesses ever leave or you know fail for whatever reason, um, the, the funds have been invested in the property itself too. So it kind of has a longevity to it as well. Trying to think, I think those are most of the, the high level pieces, um, are there any questions about the program itself, um, about the process? Oh, one big piece is that both CDAs will contribute $10,000 annually to keep this going after grant funding is exhausted. So say for example, we secure a $250,000 award, um, they are prioritizing expending the grant funds within the first 18 months. So if we can demonstrate in our application that we have a plan to, to expend those funds, get them out into the community within the first 18 months, that's an extra scoring point for us. Um, but they give us a full window of 24 to 36 months to actually exhaust those funds. So after that point, uh, both CDAs would be contributing $10,000 annually to keep this program running. Obviously the dollar amount would be much lower at that point than it is now. So um, you can see that in the grant awards section here on the screen, grant awards, grants awarded within the first 18 months can have a max of $100,000 per project. After that, we set a max of 50% of available funds at any given time, which is the same as our revolving loan program so that we make sure we're not you know, running out, basically exhausting those too quickly. Um, I do have a clause in the program that, you know, if, if the white whale comes in and it's just a home run project, we can go above and beyond to, to make that happen too. The other nice thing, and then I see I got a hand up here, um, about this is that this program can also be used in conjunction with our revolving loan program, and it can be used potentially if the stars aligned and somehow geographically it worked, which I don't think it could actually. Um, Windsor CDA also has a facade improvement grant so those can be combined. So uh, the capital stack for a, a really nice project could be substantial. I'll pause there. Renee, you have a question? Yeah, I had just had a question about the makeup of the committee. You had said one business person from a larger business. And I was thinking, does that make sense if these are four smaller businesses? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I I said a larger business, but it can it that's not the way this is written. It could be anybody from the business community. It could be a small uh, small business owner. That's totally fine. I think the way that I have it written in here is so applications for the business community member position will be accepted on a rolling basis and reviewed. Uh, by the review committee prior to appointing any business member must be employed in a managerial position or greater at a private business that is a, a member of the chamber of commerce and is located within each either municipality so it's pretty wide open i just used an example of a larger one okay 
One of the things we talked about when um, when we met to, to discuss this was a hope actually that some of the business members of the committee can almost serve as mentors or help coach some of these folks who are coming in for a loan. Um, sometimes small businesses struggle with getting started or, or keeping going and being successful. So yes, Rebecca. So on the funds, is this a one-time grant or is this something that can be reapplied for and potentially help refund the fund? <laughs> so this is the first, this is the inaugural year of this program. So this is a brand new program for WEDC. Um, if it's successful, I imagine that they probably will bring it back in the future. Um, I would guess that we probably wouldn't score as well if we just applied for it again um, with this program to say, hey, we just want to re-up our funds because some of the scoring criteria is demonstration, demonstrating need and, and those types of things. And I think it, I would venture to say that they probably would not look favorably upon us coming back with it because part of the goals here is to try to get this to be self-sustaining. Right. So it certainly doesn't preclude us from doing it. So in terms of, so you said that obviously the the fund balance would be much lower. I'm assuming that's twenty thousand dollars versus the two hundred and possibly two hundred fifty thousand. Is that what you said initially? Possibly. Yeah. So that would be a minimum, right? Okay. So if we were contributing ten thousand annually, that would be twenty thousand. But let's say there's rollover funds because they're not used from a previous year. Those types of things, right. and certainly, if either CDA at any point felt the need like, hey, this is a great program. We both have additional funds that we'd like to allocate to it. We can go above that. Is there, are there opportunities for us to help if, if the program is successful? Is, are there opportunities that you can think of for getting funds from other locations, other? Yeah. yeah. I, I think you know where I'm going. I, sure. as I would like to see if, if, if it's successful, I'd like to see us be able to fund it at a, at a little bit higher level. Yeah, as, 100%. You know. I think that would always be something that we'd be looking out for proactively. I think that it would just be responsible to the to the program itself. And I mean, maybe that's if the, the chamber at some point, you know, felt that it was a budget item for them and they wanted to contribute, maybe they could kick in funds for it too. So uh, yeah, if this, passes the point where grant funds are exhausted, we will absolutely be looking for every opportunity to bring additional funds back in. Okay, other questions? And just to clarify too, so the chamber would have been a great organization to apply for this grant program. Obviously that could have been a bridge, um, but they the stipulations of the WEDC grant doesn't let chambers apply, so. All right, so we have um, an actual resolution here. No, nope, no action really. So at the last at the last right. meeting, uh, or maybe the one before that, even uh, you all authorized me to go ahead and submit the grant. So this is more informative to let you know this is the program and get any um, you know feedback, I guess, from you all or anything that you'd want to see changed with the understanding that this is not set in stone. So any changes that we look at right now or that we might wanna look at in the future don't need to happen right now. Because again, the grant application is not gonna look exactly like this. It'll just be describing sort of the dynamics that are in the program. So um, my next step is on next Friday, the 18th is the deadline to submit hoping to submit before then. <laughs> um, and Jamie over at Windsor and I have a meeting scheduled for next Tuesday to kind of dig into the application a little bit more and, and get it sent in. Okay, great. So is, is Heike the representative for the chamber or who? So the way we have it written now, and again, this is all open to changes, it would be the executive board president. So she's the executive director and then there's a board that governs that. So whoever the executive board president of the chamber is at any given time. Okay, other questions? 
It's coming together nicely. Good. That's great. All right. With that, we'll move on. Um, section 18 transition update. Yeah, so the next few items after this on the agenda are all also pertaining to the Section 18 disposition, um, but I wanted to give a little bit more context on some other activities. As of this afternoon, all of the resident paperwork and supporting documents have been submitted to WIDA for uh, all the voucher paperwork that they were requesting. A big thank you to Jay for tracking all that down and coordinating that with residents. That was huge. Um, we are, as you all know, we've got a special meeting scheduled on October 21st to review the new leases. Um, those will have to be in place on November 1st with the reflecting the change basically being out of the public housing program. Um, they'll also be having you review a tenant selection policy. Um, if you recall from public housing, we had a, oh, I don't think I wrote it down. Continued, I did, a con admissions and continued occupancy policy, our ACOP, which basically governs all of our public housing program that stipulates that we're for elderly and disabled, um, selection criteria, income, all that stuff. So the tenant selection policy is basically a replacement for that document um, that we need to have in place to say, hey, here's here are the criteria for applying, for being in our building. This is the type of um, housing I guess we are for. And I'm trying to mirror that as much as possible after the ACOP so that we keep things the same. Um, so those will be for your review on the 21st. And then the last section 18 update is on October 24th, we're closing on the sale of the properties. And then um, I still have those, I'm waiting on a review back from HUD on our closing documents. I'm hoping that that comes tomorrow, but it's Friday and who knows who's gonna be in office on Friday. Um, so uh, if I don't hear back from them from the middle of next week, I'll be reaching out. Okay. Questions? Yes, Rebecca. Is there any possibility of getting those two documents to us prior to the 21st so that we actually have time to review them instead of trying to read through them at the same time? We're yeah, yeah. we're planning on doing it the same as we do all of our- Okay, so thanks. That we can do you ahead of time. Um, I, I've got a commitment back from our legal. I have the drafts over to them for review right now, and I think they were going to get it back to me by the 16th. 16th. So as soon as I get those, I'll get a packet out so that we have um, everybody's able to review those. Good. Anything else? We're getting there. Close, very close at this point. Very you guys got to hurry. Pretty soon, Keith and I are going to be timed out. <laughs> all right wait two weeks <laughs> all right so 7.4 is a resolute is resolution 2024-511 approving a payment of four hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars to yahara river housing llc you have the resolution in your packet move to approve we have a motion. Hang on, sorry. <laughs> we have a second. I'll second. Any discussion questions? I pause. <laughs> can we, uh, can I request, that I just noticed that there's a, a clerical error in this resolution. So, and an important one. Um, can I request somebody to maybe amend the resolution? The dollar amount should actually be 462,000. I would agree to that change we did that okay i would amend my resolution so that you can correct that amount okay all right keith agreed as well so if there's no other comments all those in favor signify by saying aye 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 opposed motion carries Everyone notice how we'll prove an amount like this and we'll argue over 25 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. All right. That's a good observation. <laughs> so item uh, 7.5 
Um, resolution 2024-512, authorizing the CDA chairperson and executive director to execute an offer to purchase with Yahara River Housing LLC. Any que questions? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Move to approve. And do you need the same? Because uh, no. this one says 457 as well. No, it, that was only for the actual fund payment to be made. So our um, this is referencing our letter of approval from HUD, which is a disposition at 457. Ah, okay. The additional amount was for closing costs. So then move to approve as written. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any comment? Otherwise, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, item 7.6, we're just going back one though. Did, what was the amount we got on the appraisal for that? 457,000. Okay, it was, okay. 7.6, resolution 2024-513, authorizing the Community Development Authority Chairperson and Executive Director to execute an offer to purchase with the CDA on behalf of Yahara River Housing LLC. Move to approve. We had a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. If there's no other comments, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item 7.7. .7. Resolution 2024-514, a resolution of necessity for the acquisition of property for the public purpose of blight elimination and to promote redevelopment for affordable housing in the village of DeForest, Dane County. That was cleverly written. What's that? <laughs> blight elimination? <laughs> that's, what, that, that's the deal. Um, what it is. So. It is, you're right. Yeah. Um, before we move forward with uh, the direct condemnation procedures, we have to basically, statute says, we have to make a, 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 a resolution of finding of necessity, basically demonstrating that there is a need for us to, to go through the condemnation process. Um, so that's what this is tonight. Assuming this is approved, uh, I'll give kind of a breakdown of what the next steps are because it is a, a bit of a process. Um, so after we potentially approve the resolution and necessity of finding, um, we'll order an appraisal of the property. Um, we have to kind of go through a bit of a negotiation period again with the property owner, which is, is not really going to happen as we know, because we haven't had any communications. Um, but we have to, that's part of the statutory obligation to do that. We have to send our full narrative appraisal to the property owner so that they're aware of the, um, the proposed dollar amount. Um, after we go through another series of negotiations as however long that may or may not take, um, if, we, if that fails, which it's likely to fail, uh, we then would extend a jurisdictional offer to purchase, which is exactly what it sounds. It's a municipality or this type of an entity uh, extending an offer to purchase. They have a period of time to either accept that, um, challenge it, and the challenge is, is typically challenging the dollar amount um, or do nothing and reject it. Um, both of those, if they reject it out of hand, they reject it if they do nothing within that window, it's also rejected. If it's rejected, then we have to go to circuit court, um, who then will essentially review the process that we've taken to get here. And assuming boxes are checked, we've done everything appropriately, um, and the, the, the necessity is there, uh, they will basically rec rectify the decision to, to have us purchase the property. Um, it then goes to a county commission to review the, the price and to make a determination on whether that or not that's an, a reasonable offer. Um, so that's kind of the road that we have to go down at this point. At the last meeting, um, you also authorized me to uh, 
start to execute a relocation plan. There was some question that we had as to whether or not a, basically a non-operational business, how can you relocate something that essentially is not there? Um, and uh, our attorneys got a response from Department of Administration. And I based on the fact that there may be personal property in there, which also has to be relocated in any of these types of situations, we're gonna go ahead and, and do a relocation plan regardless and, and make sure that we have that box checked too. So I've already reached out to our engineering consultants at Veerbicker to see about um, getting that plan moving forward. And um, I will be reaching out to an appraiser here uh, probably tomorrow, assuming this resolution gets passed. So that's kind of the, the path forward here. And um, yeah, we'll see. I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe we can re-engage too with the property owner. Okay. With that, I would entertain a motion to approve resolution 2024-514. Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a couple of seconds. <laughs> um, any further comment or questions? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, there is no old business tonight. Um, nine reports. Housing division reports. So, oops, sorry. Sun Square. Yep. On the financial side of things, not a whole ton to report here. Um, kind of tracking fairly steadily. I did talk with um, Penny on our finance team this morning, and we're going to start forwarding invoices to Attic Angel starting this week or next week, I guess. Um, to this point, we've still been handling them internally here and now we're going to start to make that switch there's a little bit of a timing issue with getting them set up on our accounts um, and i think we're past that hurdle now i think right yeah um one of the other things that uh we're jay and i and carol are working through right now is a preliminary budgets for jefferson square and public housing and redevelopment obviously um, and I'm hoping to have those at our November meeting. I guess that's a, a question that I put to you all is uh, the meeting on the 21st is specifically for the leases. Would you want to keep that a sh short meeting only for those and not look at budget stuff? Or would you like a draft budget at that meeting? What is your preference? Yeah. Rachel's shaking her head. However, uh I would prefer a short one. Okay. Just because I'm very close to my people. Okay, that's fine. Um, other people? Yeah. I won't be here. Well, then we can't have a budget discussion. <laughs> okay. All right, and I'm open to either way. So if we want to do this one short, it means you got to be up for a longer meeting the next time. So on the public housing side of things, so I think I mentioned at the last meeting that we finally got through the HUD barrier and uh, secured our operating subsidy. So you'll see that here, the 21,000 hit our accounts. That was a big positive. Um, there are some legal costs that we've been incurring. Most of that's associated with the Section 18 disposition, although some of that is also um, with some tenant related issues at, at um, the facilities as well. Uh, and then you'll also see some costs associated with the unit turns that we had uh, in that month as well. Are the bed bugs good now or not? Ongoing, ongoing. I could. Uh, they're healthy. Yeah, they're unfortunately they're they're good. Um, no, so we we have one unit, and I'll probably let Jay talk a little bit more about this too. We have one unit in particular that's been a challenge with for us, um, and we've kind of been trying to wrap our heads around it. But um, I think we got a good plan in place. Do you want to maybe talk about what we got going? Uh. 
tomorrow, uh, we have a company coming out to uh, evaluate the unit for a heat treatment. Um, and fingers crossed, uh, resident will do what she needs to do to get her apartment ready. Uh, it's been the hang up, what, what we feel is probably the hang up in this process all along. So I'm hopeful, but um, remains to be seen what'll, how it'll turn out. But we're just uh, doing everything by the book, so to say, to make sure that our, if we have to go forward with another process, we can, so. Um, our current contractors use uh, chemical treatment and that's been successful. They've been great for us at all the other units. It, it's resolved the issue. Um, they don't do heat treatments and heat treatment is kind of a next step, which again, as Jay kind of alluded to, assuming that the room or the residence is prepped appropriately, it, it's, an, it's an effective step. So that's where that sits. I can tell you that we've done heat treatments there in the past. Oh, really? So, okay. Yep. Good to know. Were they successful? Okay. Well, I, like I said, I'm, I, we're both hopeful over here because we don't want this to continue, obviously, for everybody's sake. Well, we don't want it to move to our new building when we get to that point. So. That's true. Yep. And yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Are there, uh, <clears throat> back on Jefferson Square for a minute, it, Things going well so far with Attic Angels? Um, Jay can probably speak to that better than I can. Yeah, they got, they're, they have the same growing pains, I think, you know, that we all have when, when we have a change. Um, getting your feet under, you, uh, they have a maintenance man hired. He's going to be working 25 hours a week. Um, he's, he's nice. He's, Got a full plate already. Um, I, I think that I think they're going to do fine. I haven't heard anything negative from um, residents yet, so that's good. Um, and there, I would like to see a little bit more communication. I, I just feel like they aren't using, you know, uh, me as a resource anyway to, you know, help as much as I would kind of have expected. But you know. Um, it's not, you know, they're not required to do so either. So um, I've offered to help out in any way I can. And when they want or need it, I'll be available. Okay. We'll keep us informed. So, yeah. Jay, are you experiencing withdrawal? <laughs> no withdrawal. No. <laughs> I was actually at the clubhouse today. Uh, I stopped by 720. Um, and there was a bunch of people playing games and I kind of just walked through it. I didn't even get cat called. So that was good. <laughs> I think they forgot about me already. Well, that's good news. So we want it to go well and we want you to be able to move on. So. No, 714 is that 714 to Forest Street is, uh, the, is the vacant unit that um, it was, uh, was um, Mana Dupin? Mana Dupin, correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep, she, she moved out. Um, on the finance side of things, like I said, we're sort of still getting to the point where they'll be handling a little bit more. I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. I mean, we're, we probably will at the next meeting. Okay. Yep. Renee? This was going to make a note on this slide that we should update the head header on the top. It says May. <laughs> at least, at least it doesn't say like 2022 or 2023 on it. Thank you, Renee. I can only do so much. <laughs> Rachel. I, no, I'm just saying you probably need to handle this. <laughs> um, so good segue onto the housing summary. Um, I could also likely update the wait list for Jefferson Square as soon as we get that updated number from Attic Angel. So they are managing the wait list now. So I'm sure that that number is no longer 33. Um, honestly, the 31 for public housing is irrelevant at this point as well um, because 
we I've closed our wait list because we can't take any new residents until after November 1st. So um, both of those numbers at the moment are probably meaningless. <laughs> um, in terms of unit turns, both 714 and 720 are listed on here. If you recall, we had somebody uh, who had a reservation deposit for 720 DeForest. Um, they actually canceled. So uh, we got to a point where they would have needed to withdraw funds from some accounts that would have had some major tax implications for them. And they opted not to do it. There was a discussion at the time about whether or not we would consider offering a bridge loan to them to move in. And it just was a risk that um, we weren't willing to take. So uh, they did move on. And I, uh, for the next meeting, I'm sure we'll have an update on where both of those units stand from Attic Angel. Um, I know they've been pounding the pavement, so I wouldn't be surprised if they have some good leads on both of those. Actually, Demery told me today via email uh, that she has a meeting um, next week for 714 on interested party and two showings next week also for 720. Uh, 720 unit is, it's very, very close to being done. Um, the countertops were installed, the plumbing's installed, uh, waiting for appliances now and basically some odds and ends to touch up and make sure that everybody is, uh, you know, the punch list gets completed, but it, it, it'll be ready to be moved in really soon. So it should, it should show well for her at least. Nice. And then again, uh, 114 over at public housing can be filled until after November 1st. Okay. And are all the duplexes full now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, any questions on the on the housing division reports? Then redevelopment division, financial update, anything there? Um, not too much. I will say that we did request the pre-development funds per the funding agreement with the village for the new facility. We had a, a pre-development, um, we could request up to $250,000 for pre-development activity. Uh, that agreement had it broken out into two sort of tranches, I guess, with the first being 30% of that total. And so we did make the request for that. You'll probably see that at the next on the next statement, I would guess. Um, you'll also likely see the deposit of $462,000 on the next statement, um, as this is uh, redevelopment will be the account that those funds will be dispersed to from the village. And that will also be the account that is then making the payment to the LLC. So that'll be in there as well. Um, and then the other thing of note on the redevelopment side of things is that our borrower through the loan program has requested a final invoice and is intending to pay off the remaining of their balance on the loan. Okay. Yeah. Anything else on redevelopment? If not, I'll announce that the Community Development Authority Board will convene into closed session pursuant to Section 19.851C of the Wisconsin Statutes for purposes of considering employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercises responsibility discussing compensation and promotion of an employee tonight. So I would entertain a motion to convene and to close. All right, is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. All right, Commissioner Upadier. Commissioner Witherspoon. Yes. Commissioner Mankey. Commissioner Briggs. Yes. Commissioner Buheim. Yes. Commissioner Wurzba. Yes. Chairperson Cahill Wolfgram. Yes. There we go. All right, we will move to item 13, um, action resulting from closed session and um, discussion and possible action to approve a new hourly wage rate, wage rate. 
and to set an annual vacation allowance for Jay Millen. Um, I would entertain a motion to approve the rate and the hours as discussed and closed. I would move to approve a wage rate of 29.06 and um, increase in vacation starting January 1st to 180 hours. Is there a second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further comment? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. <laughs> Item 14, any other business that comes before this body, lawfully comes before this body? If not, um, please note the next meeting dates of October 21 and November 14th. And I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. There's a motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We're adjourned at 7.09 p.m. Yeah, we're well, good.